Welcome everyone. My name is Kristen miller Zone, and I'm Executive Director of Costume Society of America. Tina Bates was Curator of History at the Canadian Museum of History for 22 years. She has published widely in the field of dress, including A Cultural History of the Nurses' Uniform, the 2013 Milia Davenport Publication Award winner. She has been Editor-in-Chief of Dress since 2014. She will be interviewed today by another illustrious member of CSA, Cynthia Cooper. Cynthia is Head of Collections and Research, as well as Curator of Dress, Fashion and Textiles at the McCord Museum in Montreal. There she oversees the largest museum collection of Canadian dress, consisting of over 20,000 items. I will now turn it over to you, Cynthia. Okay, thank you, Kristen. And good evening, everyone. Um, and thanks for joining us this evening. So to begin with full disclosure, uh, Tina, I've known you for a very long time. Um, and in fact, I think the first time that we met was when I attended an event at the National Library of Canada in Ottawa, probably in 88 or 89, and you and your dance group gave a performance and you discussed the group's reproduction 18th century clothing. And uh, so can you tell us what you were doing at that time? Well, when uh, the performance that I did or the talk that I gave at the library um, was because I was part of a Baroque dance group 18th century, you know, min minuet, right? And um, so I was sort of wardrobe mischief for, for that group because no one else in the group really had any idea what 18th century costume was like. So we all wore corsets and panniers and the whole, the whole shebang uh, that we got made. So I, I think the talk was about making costumes for the, for the mm -hmm. dance performance. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. at that time too, I guess um, I was working for Parks Canada. Um, before that I was working um, for historic sites and I got interested in um, food ways um, uh, and um, costume history as well. With food ways I wrote a book called Out of Old Ontario Kitchens but that was um, millennia ago and um, then I started working for Parks Canada and with Parks Canada um, I was the historian for some of the historic site homes in which children were represented as the history of the houses so I started a project on um, the history of children's clothing. Mm -hmm. And so actually I remember hearing you present on children's clothing at, um, at my very first CSA symposium which was in Boston in 1991 and you were presenting on, I still remember it, prescription and, uh, and practice in dressing uh, children. Oh, so that's that the first symposium as well? Yeah, I, it was, I don't know if it was the first one I went to, but it was the first one that I presented at a um, uh, symposium. And I remember um, being so nervous, oh, it's just terribly nervous. And um, a colleague and friend of mine was in the audience, uh, Pam Buell, and she said that um, her, her, she, she was just as nervous as I was when I went up to the, the podium. But um, that's kind of when my association with the Costume Society really began. Um, and I, I have really in the past um, many years learned so much um, from being part of the Costume Society um, uh, the wonderful symposia, the field trips in which we got to see lots of things and drink uh, plenty of margaritas. Um, yeah, so that, that was a highlight. Uh, I think that one, this picture is from Santa Fe was the, um, the symposium. Um, but I just learned a lot from CSA um, in terms of leadership um, in an organization, a volunteer organization mainly, um, and um, the collegiality of, of all the members who have, you know, supported me um, over the years, and mainly the, the passion that the members have for the, for the field of uh, dress and fashion. 
Um, well, well, uh, uh, I could uh, say a resounding ditto to that. <laughs> um, it's, much, it's much the same way I feel about CSA. Uh, but coming back to that paper in Boston, well, I had no idea you were uh, you were nervous. Uh, but you, can you tell us what influences were shaping the work that you were doing at that time? Um, well. At that time, um, it was uh, really in the middle of what was called the new social history. And that was really um, looking at uh, um, ordinary people and ordinary lives rather than the traditional history that had been gone on for some time, which was military, economics, uh, politics. Uh, the sort of, you know, important uh, man uh, uh, way of looking at history. And I think certainly that way of looking at history um, has really stayed with me um, at, even, even after, I guess, by the 80s into the 90s, um, it, it took kind of a cultural term, turn which was um, still looking at ordinary people in ordinary lives, but um, through the lens of gender and class and, and, and race, and also the importance of, of really understanding how these things worked um, um, to, to identify um, what were the mechanisms by which um, gender, class, race, etc., cetera, was, um, was explored. Mm -hmm. So, and right around then, with Boston 1991, the spring of 1991, you uh, had just made or were about to make a career change. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I started um, as a historian, uh, curator, or curator in history at the Canadian Museum of History, so, um, which was then called the Canadian Museum of Civilization. Um, since then, it has become less civilized. But anyway, that's another story altogether. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I started in 1991 and I stayed there until I retired in uh, 2012. Um, right. Yeah. So, and, but you were not hired as a curator of dress. As I recall, you were, your title was curator of Ontario history. So how was it structured and how did you make a place for your interests um, within the, the organization? So um, the Museum of History is not a decorative arts museum. So um, uh, it is more organized in the history division part of it. There's also ethnology and um, uh, native studies and, and folklore. Uh, but the history part of it is organized uh, more, well, first of all, it was geographically and then thematically. Um, so I was the curator of Ontario history and then of uh, domestic history and labor. Um, and uh, so they had no curators of any particular parts of the collections. Um, and so when I first arrived there, um, pretty well all my colleagues were men um, and uh, most of them with PhDs, but I only had an MA, but hell, they hired me, so why not? Um, and um, the history collection itself was really quite um, a mishmash of things because um, it, uh, the, the people who had developed it uh, before I got there really almost accepted anything that was donated, which uh, we as curators know is not the best uh, uh, way of doing things. Um, but um, I still uh, uh, found a lot of interesting things, I think, uh, within the collection. Um, and um, of course, because of my interest, I turned to the costume collection. Um, which really, at the beginning anyway, was not taken terribly seriously by my colleagues who were working on political and economic history and so on. Um, but um, I had a fair bit of freedom and I'm very good at working under the radar so that no one sort of really knows what I'm doing. And I'll have to say that I hope that 
curators of fashion and dress don't have to do that anymore. But anyway, I was able uh, to uh, get the confidence to do uh, work, um, confidence from my colleagues at the Costume Society of America and elsewhere, and to continue um, with exhibitions and publishing and, and so on. Oh, great. So tell us uh, about some of the highlights of your work, the, the various projects, costume related projects that you worked on um, in the time that you spent there. Well, Cynthia, I, th I thought that you'd probably ask me that, so I prepared some slides <laughs> which, which uh, Kristen can, um, can put up. So this is the Canadian Museum of History, which is just across the, the river from the Ottawa River from, um, from Ottawa. And um, the next slide is uh, a collection of um, uh, 400 hats from the 1920s, mostly cloche style hats that were found in a milliner's attic in a, in a small town um, in Ontario. Um, next slide, and you can see some examples of, uh, of the hats. This was a wonderful project and it was one of those things that could pro probably never be done now in a museum in that the museum was offered all the hats that were in this attic. Um, and I think the Royal Ontario Museum took maybe uh, 20 and we took 400. <laughs> so while it's ridiculous to have 400 um, hats at the same time, um, uh, it meant that I could really uh, begin a, a great research uh, project on that and uh, be able to public publicize that as well. So the next slide is, uh, is a Haudenosaunee um, or Iroquois um, beaded Orange Lodge crown, so Orange Lodge, a fraternal order. This was a Mohawk um, a fraternal order, uh, the Orange Lodge. And um, uh, one of the wonderful things in working on exhibitions, as we know, is working with conservation. So I found this poor thing um, that was in pretty bad shape. Um, and 250 hours later, I think it was, our conservator um, made it into the next slide shape. Next slide. Yeah, it's just a wonderful thing. You can see on the front there, King Billy um, on his white horse, um, uh, the symbol of the Orange Lodge. And um, another thing was, uh, of course, working with exhibit designers and so um, he, the exhibit designer, put it on a on a pedestal which was rotating, so you could see all the symbols around it. And uh, next slide. So, um, oh, I meant to tell you too, just a quick story about that same exhibit that the um, Orange Lodge crown was in, and it was an exhibit on hats and headwear and their meanings. And one of them was, um, I, I wanted an, R I had an RCM, uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police um, Stetson, but recent, in the recent years, um, they had a couple of uh, Sikh officers in the RCMP. And so I wanted a turban, but it just so happened that that was a very controversial thing going on at that time, um, uh, despite that Canada thinks it, it's very, you know, it, it fosters diversity in its society. The RCMP actually um, uh, said that uh, Sikh should, Sikh should not be able to wear their turbans while on duty. And that controversy is still going on, even though they lost it then. So anyway, I contacted their museum and I said, I, I want a turban to put in my exhibit. And that took quite a long time. And then finally, just as the exhibit was opening, um, I got it, which was, of course, a flat piece of cloth, right? That's really what a turban is. Mm -hmm. So we managed to find a Sikh member of the community and um, he, he uh, put it up for me and I, I, and, um, I put it on exhibit. So this next slide shows another uh, highlight of the collection, I think, which is uh, to do with the Dion quintuplets. So these are clothing 
This is actually clothing that was worn by the Dion quintuplets who were born um, during the Great Depression in a small town in northern Ontario, which um, opened its doors to thousands and thousands of people who came to see them. Uh, maybe the next slide will show a... This slide is, is again, um, some of the clothing that was worn and what they were actually wearing on, in Look magazine. The next slide is um, that you can see that sort of um, platform with, so the gir little girls would be playing in the center of that platform and you can see all the people lined up ready to go in and see these miracle babies. It's a very sad story, to be honest, but it's it's uh, quite an incredible collection. Uh, and the next one, next slide, is uh, one of the highlights of being at the museum um, was an exhibition that I worked with you, Cynthia, on uh, dressing up Canada late Victorian fancy dress balls. Um, uh, and you had put together an incredible collection from various places um, that had been worn at um, fancy dress uh, balls in, uh, in uh, vice regal balls um, in Victorian Canada. And I uh, had just acquired this um, Duchess of Canada Day dress, uh, which was worn um, at the um, uh, in, at the Fiesta San Antonio, um, and the, the the mother of this girl here um, contacted the museum, and of course it came to me, um, saying that um, this is the Duchess of Canada Day, and did we want it? So I said yes, and Cynthia let me put it on exhibit. <laughs> And uh, well, those that that's certainly an, an, a, a nice memory. And then um, I think probably the next slide shows your um, your uh, bit of your final and, and maybe most significant project. And would you like to tell us about that? Oh, sure. So I got a call from the Canadian Nurses Association. Um, oh, I don't know, in 2000 maybe. Um, and they had actually made a collection that had to do with nursing history um, that they were trying to divest themselves of. And um, they wanted to know what to do, what to do with it, um, would we take any of it. And um, I got together with my colleagues at the Canadian War Museum and the Na La Library and Archives Canada, um, and we started a Canadian nursing history collection. So um, I spent half my year practically um, in the Canadian in the um, Canadian Nurses Association uh, building um, uh, picking and choosing uh, things for, for the collection. So um, uh, I was able to build up quite a Canadian nursing history collection um, from there from uh, the Toronto Nurses Association um, and various other um, nursing associations so um it's now i don't know how many objects but it's in the thousands and thousands of objects um and so um i did an exhibition I, cu I curated an exhibition um on nursing history in canada it was a big uh, exhibition six thousand square feet so what you see on the slide there is the opening of it and um we had a little pin that we gave to anyone who identified themselves as a nurse it was quite nice and then we had a we had a catwalk um, in, in which various people from across Canada, the inset that you see in that slide is actually um, the BC history of nursing people who um, did their own little fashion show. We had military nurses and that was, that was really fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the, the memories that strikes me is you telling me about um, your dining room as you, um, as you worked on this project and how um, you had uh, trying, drawing connections between uniforms and styles of caps, you had papered it with, uh, with photographs. I yeah, I think I have a picture because I just wanted to show you a few uh, bits of information um, about that project. But this slide is actually just um, 
uh, in the exhibit. And then you see the picture below with um, a nurse who was a volunteer. Um, and the nurses would volunteer in the exhibit. Um, and in this case, the nurse um, on the left is dressing up uh, a visitor to the museum um, in a nursing sister um, uniform, um, and that was that was really fantastic to have actual um, registered nurses as volunteers in the exhibit. So the next slide. It, this is me um, in the exhibit. Next slide is my dining room. So what, what happened was when I finished with this exhibition, which is a, 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 you know, the, the whole of, of nursing history in Canada um, from, from New France um, through to the present day, um, I thought to myself, am I finished with nursing history? Um, but uh, hell, I'm a, I'm a costume historian. So, um, you know, could I, and of course, I was interested in the uniforms, so I thought that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to concentrate on the uniforms. So I, I was able to actually, very strange for a museum curator, get a bit of a sabbatical to start the research on the nurses' uniforms. So this is while I'm home on my in my dining room. And so um, the next slide, it's just. Um, just a slide to say to the viewers, if you thought you knew what a what a nurse's uniform looked like, you think again, because uh, here are some of the ones that are in our collection. And the next slide. So uh, the the um, collections that we have um, at the museum really start in the late 19th century. So you see on the left here the graduates of Toronto General Hospital with their funny little caps um, and then a beautiful uh, interesting denim uh, dress on the right and the next slide. And here uh, for Cynthia I put in the Montreal General Hospital uh, photograph with them um, with the uh, um, matron in black in the center of the photograph and um, the physician um, with his heron uh, in, in the center as well. Next slide. Um, and then through to the early 20th century, um, this is Montreal again. Uh, in a, a lot of cases, I was able to have um, images of the nurse herself, um, as well as the, the uniform itself. Next. So when I think you can see a difference between the pictures I just showed you and this one where nursing is nursing education is starting to become very standardized and the look is uh, much more severe and um, you get um, those very very heavily starched bibs um, and so nursing is nursing education is really taking itself seriously now next slide and um, then you get uh, to the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s. You can see the short sleeves now. This is at the Montreal General uh, Nursing uh, uh, Residence. Um, and the caps have become um, much more standardized and um, um, uh, smaller in, in the circumference of them. Next slide. And uh, nurses, nurses all started to behave differently. In the 19th century, when they were trying to change the viewpoint of the, the nurse, um, who was uh, often a, a working class woman, they were trying to make nursing into a middle class trade. And so that's when you got those early 20th century pictures. Um, but then by the 1920s and, and 30s, um, nurses uh, were just um, young women uh, who wanted to have a career and um, a life as well. <laughs> Next slide. Um, and then the beginning of the end, uh, pantsuits um, start to come in, um, partly because it was at the same time as girls were wearing very short skirts. 
So you can imagine how that would go over bending over a bed with uh, a miniskirt on. So the hospital started to allow pantsuits. Um, and then by that time, um, nurses started to say, why do we feel that we have to control how nurses look when we give them so much responsibility? So really um, the whole idea of a uniform just kind of went, went away. Next slide. And then of course you, you get the, the scrubs um, that coming in, um, which actually came out of uh, surgical wear. And this is my grand niece, Katie, who uh, graduated from nursing school recently. So it was nice to include her because her picture is now in my book. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's a good segue. I think it's uh, it's really important to to highlight that then this became a book, the cultural history of the nurses' uniform, which was a um, uh, recipient of the Melia Davenport Award. Somewhere in there, you retired and then and and you know, worked on the book on, on that very high note. Um, but I know that your retirement was uh, um, you you sort of retired, but then many other things have have continued to come your way. So tell us uh, what happened in 2014 <laughs> when you were oh, contacted by, by Sally Helvenston Gray. <laughs> Sally um, asked me if I would become the editor-in-chief of Dress um, and I agreed without quite realizing what I was getting into. <laughs> But it has been it has been um, a, a joy, and it's been such a great thing for me to be able to do when I'm retired because it it keeps me in the field. It keeps me um, uh, finding out what what the scholars are doing, what students are interested in, um, and so it has been a, a really great challenge for me. And. Um, Dress was founded in 1975, I think it was, and so it, next to Costume, it is the oldest in the English language uh, journal devoted to dress and fashion, and um, uh, I think it's I think it's still the best. Um, uh, and what I like about it is that it um, includes both academic papers as well as papers from curators um, who are highlighting things from their collection. So that's uh, very different from, I think, a lot of the uh, journals that have bubbled up um, in the last 10 years or so that are about um, dress and fashion and, and uh, body, body, uh, uh, body-ness. Um, and um, I, I, think, I think it dress is really special. And I encourage anyone watching to contact me if you have some ideas for uh, contributions. So let's let's hope they flood in in the chat box. Um, and in the meantime, um, I know you've continued to do your own research. So what, tell us what you're working on now. Um, uh, again, um, I've always liked to work on people at the margins uh, and so I'm working on prison uniforms. Uh, the records of the uh, uh, Kingston Penitentiary are in our National Archives here in Ottawa. And so I've been going through them. And one of the um, parts of that record um, is uh, uh, mugshot uh, books of incoming uh, uh, incarcerated people um, into the prisons, into the penitentiary system. And they, from the late 19th and into the 1920s, and they are fascinating. So I've been studying those um, because you get the mugshot and then a description of the person, including any tattoos and so on. So it's it's sort of um, what you see is from here up. Uh, often they've come with their hats on, and you can see what they're wearing on top. Um, and and also it's described what's on their body. So I think it's uh, I think it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. That does sound fascinating. Um, I'm going to uh, invite uh, anyone who has a question um, uh, for Tina to uh, submit it in the chat box and, um, and I'll be happy to, uh, 
to field those questions and um, and uh, and that way you can chat with Tina. Uh, but I wanted to just raise one other point about our, our lives outside CSA a little bit. And uh, one of the things that I've I've continued to love about CSA and the community of dress scholars is that um, I found a lot of kind kindred spirits who are generally creative people who like to live outside the box. And um, and uh, as are you. So would you like to tell us some of the other ways uh, in that in which that creativity plays out in your in your personal interests? Kristen, can you put the slide on? Oh. <laughs> so so um, we, I, I have to confess that both Cynthia and I love jazz and we've also both performed jazz. Cynthia is a saxophone player and I'm a, a vocalist and so we have been a couple of years, two or three years, to a jazz camp um, in, on, in a, on a lake, a lovely lake in, in Quebec and um, this was um, last year. Next slide. Woohoo, there she oh. is. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Cynthia on her saxophone. So um, <laughs> that's what we do. That's what we do in our spare time. Yes, yes. You, you snuck those in. <laughs> good good for you. Okay, well we have we have some questions. So the first question um, is from Christina Tixira. And she says, I'm curious about pockets. As a nurse, I never feel I have enough pockets. And looking at these historical nurses' uniforms, they don't seem to have any. Or if they do, they do, there are very few. Is there a clear evolution of pockets in nurses' uniforms? Um, yes. Um, the early ones do have a, a watch uh, pocket up, up here. Um, that they can put their watch in um, but they also um, had like patch pockets uh, quite often um, and when early on when nurses were wearing those big uh, bibs you they would stuff things um, inside the bib um, they a lot of them talked about that and then I think when uh, they got rid of the bibs and the sleeve shortened and everything changed um, um, they they just had like uh, uh, set in pockets, but I can completely understand that there's not enough. Oh, and early on too, they they wore chatelaines, nursing chatelaines. So there were little scissors and uh, thermometer and things like that. And uh, but that was just that was in the 19th century. So I can completely um, uh, understand why there's never enough pockets. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Um, another question, when exactly did the nurse's uniform go away to be replaced by scrubs and when did the cap disappear? The cap uh, disappeared um, at about the same time um, as um, the nurses started to wear a pantsuits uh, and uh, their own purchased uh, uh, uniforms that they could uh, you know, purchase off the Sears catalog. Um, and that was in the 1970s. By the end of the 1970s, um, uh, nurses in uh, surgery started to wear scrubs in the same way that the physicians wore scrubs um, and anybody else, the anesthetists and so on. And so the nurses started wearing scrubs and then the scrubs really crept out of surgery and uh, made their way um, in the early 80s into um, the rest of, of nursing wear. Okay, uh, another question is where can, where can one find your book? How does one purchase your book for a niece who is a nurse? Um, 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 I guess the best, I think Amazon, you can, through Amazon. Um, I don't know if they'd still have it, um, but also the, just ask, uh, Google the Canadian Museum of History um, publications through there. Okay, great. Um, from Margaret Ordonez, Ordon Ordonez, tell us about your island escape in the summer and the muse museum work that you do then. Oh, that's sweet. Um, yeah, 
Um, well, uh, I've been going to the island of Nevis, St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, for many years, and uh, they have a little museum there um, and a number of historic sites, as you might imagine, uh, sugar plantations and so on. But the the museum and its collections were just in terrible shape. Uh, there were artifacts uh, shoved into boxes in the um, back office, along with uh, you know office supplies and staplers and things like. Like that. Um, so uh, the last couple of years I've had a project to um, bring it all together in one place um, and, and catalog it because they had really had no idea what they had. Um, so that that is just an ongoing ongoing uh, project and of course it's in a warm place in the winter so I really um, can't complain. Um, are there any other questions for Tina? I think we've just about covered it. Oh, here's another one from Jennifer Millen. Um, in your current research, have you come across any historical garments worn by incarcerated individuals? Well, there's some in the collections in the UK and there's some in the US, but um, there's very little, um, at least for the time period that I'm looking at um, in Canada that I've found so far, but it's something that I really, it's a really good question and I really need to, to go further with that because it's one thing, as you know, to look at photographs, um, and another thing, it, it will give you so much more information if you can actually examine the objects themselves. Thanks for that question. All right. Um, we have a further question about, uh, is this webinar available for future viewing? And I think uh, Kristen can fill, it, fill us in, but as far as I know it is. Um, uh, so Tina, I think we've covered all the questions. It's, it's really been a, a, a delight. Um, uh, uh, going back in time and um, and seeing the path of your career, um, condensing it into this uh, this conversation, and uh, um, I've I've really enjoyed uh, uh, interviewing you, and I'm sure that uh, future um, uh, uh, CSA members who'd like to watch this in the future um, will uh, will benefit from knowing um, how, just what you've done over the course of your lengthy career. So thanks very much. Well, thank you, Cynthia. That was really fun, too, because uh, we go back a long way. <laughs> we do, yes. <laughs>